Hello everyone. My name is Ferhan. I'm a research fellow in the Engineering and Translation Science Group, and I work on nanoplasmonics. I used to work on uh, nanomaterials development and exploiting nanoplasmonics for endpoint sensing applications, but I've since shifted towards employing nanoplasmonics for biointerficial science. Nanoplasmonics for biointerficial science is uh, one of the main research teams in the group, which I think is rather inspirational as it is a unique aspect of nanoplasmonic sensing that has yet to be fully explored. So as per the title of this talk, Engineering in Translational Science, a different take on nanoplasmonic sensing, I will walk you through my research journey and highlight some of the key projects that I've been involved in since I joined the group. Let me just give a brief introduction on uh, nanoplasmonics. So nanoplasmonics is a subset of plasmonics, which deals with the interaction of light with uh, plasmon active materials or materials with a free electron cloud that have dimensions smaller than the wavelength of light, or in other words, uh, nano-sized materials. Most popular among these are noble metal nanoparticles, such as gold and silver. So when these materials or nanoparticles are illuminated even with white light, various plasmon modes can be generated. The most prominent being the localized surface plasmon resonance, or LSPR, which uh, is the collective oscillation of the conduction band of electrons around the nanostructure. This is highly sensitive to the local refractive index change and leads to an enhancement in the electromagnetic field in the immediate vicinity of the nanostructure. So both of these factors make it very attractive for molecular sensing applications. The molecular binding event is typically detected as a shift in the peak of the extinction or adsorbance spectra. So when light is either passed through or transmitted across the nanostructure or even reflected off the nanostructures. So how did I start working on nanoplasmonics? So here's a brief overview of my research journey. I started getting involved in biosensor research since 2007 or 2008, when I was an undergraduate fulfilling my internship requirement at one of the ASTAR research institutes. ASTAR, by the way, is the Agency for Science, Technology and Research in Singapore. So back then I was mainly working on electrochemical biosensors, detecting nucleic acids and uh, glucose by means of growing silver nanoparticles across uh, interdigitator electrodes. Then I expanded my knowledge and continued to sharpen my skill on noble nanoparticle synthesis during my postgraduate studies. At the same time, I was also working on polymer brushes, mainly to eliminate non-specific absorption of proteins on biosensor surfaces. And it was during this time that I was uh, juggling between nanoparticle chemistry and organic chemistry, and I explored the idea of incorporating nanoparticles within a polymer brush matrix to achieve plasmon-active nanoparticle polymer nanocomposites. So at this stage, I was doing a lot of nanomaterials development for biosensing. Here are some of the projects that I worked on for my PhD. Here's the incorporation of gold nanoparticles in polymer brushes. So you can control the architecture of the polymer brush and you can achieve tunable assembly of the nanoparticles. And because of that, you can control the mobility of the nanoparticles as well as the uh, overall nanoplasmonic response. And if the nanoparticles are small enough, you can actually infiltrate they can actually infiltrate the brush, leading to a highly packed 3D assembly. So this is advantageous because highly packed assemblies of gold nanoparticles usually give an intense color on the substrate. So we can use it for color colorimetric based sensing. So in one example, we have uh, the lead catalyzed leaching of gold that led to the release of the gold nanoparticles from the polymer matrix. And the concentration of lead can be derived from the color change of the substrate. We also have highly dense assemblies of gold and rods, which is difficult to achieve without the polymer brush because of the repulsive nature of the fractal capped gold and rods. 
But here we can have a uniform highly dense assembly over a long range. So this is ideal for creating plasmonic surface enhanced substrates. You can see here clearly that the assembly is uniform over the entire glass slide, right? So this substrate can be used for SERS applications or even plasmon enhanced fluorescence applications. And then at the end of my postgraduate studies, I moved over to the engineering in translational science group. And that was when I realized that there is actually huge potential for nanoplasmonics beyond just endpoint detection. The technology can be used for biointerficial science. So especially when combined with biological membrane models, it becomes an attractive platform for addressing real challenges in healthcare and medicine, most prominently because of its ability to extract mechanistic insights, or quantitative insights, then can, that can uh, contribute or pave the way for the development of new uh, therapeutic strategies. What makes surface-based nanoplasmonic platforms perfect for biointerventional science is that they are highly surface sensitive with an effective penetration or sensing depth of around five to 30 nanometers. So five to 30 nanometers closely matches the dimensions of common biological entities. Uh, for example, the thickness of a lipid bilayer or lipid membrane is around five nanometers. Um, proteins that we're all very familiar with, like BSA and IgG have dimensions in the range of uh, 10 to 20 nanometers. So this means that the subtle changes to their conformation can be detected with a great deal of precision and with high spatial temporal resolution because the conformational changes will occur within the effective sensing depth of the nanoplasmonic transducer. In other words, at the region where the, the electromagnetic field enhancement is the highest. So we see here that the works performed in the group can be divided into these four quadrants. Right? We use it for studying vesicle adsorption, understanding how vesicles deform upon contact with the substrate. We use it for spatial proximity sensing to understand how lipid composition affects the distance between lipid bilayers and the underlying surface. We can also use it for studying protein adsorption to see what happens to a protein molecule when it comes into contact with a substrate surface, whether it undergoes adsorption-induced conformational change or adsorption-induced denaturation, and what is the propensity of this happening, whether it spreads out or remains rigidly attached while maintaining its original structure, whether it forms monolayers or whether it forms multilayers, and what happens on curved surfaces versus flat surfaces, is it the same? And all these things you can, you can track. And lastly, we can use nanoplasmonics to understand molecular membrane interactions. For example, we've been actively using it to study how peptides interact with lipid membranes, both in the form of an intact vesicle as well as spotted lipid bilayers. So right now, our surface-based nanoplasmonic platforms comprise mainly of gold nanoparticles, nano discs, nano rods, nano, nano, nano wells, nano holes, and nano ribbons. But of course, there are other nanostructures out there which are worth exploring. Uh, so you can imagine the vast potential of this platform, and we're only at the beginning of this uh, really exciting journey. So to fully exploit nanoplasmonics for biointerficial science, you first need to have a good biointerfacing strategy. So to achieve precise controllable interfacing, you need to have a platform that integrates optics with fluidics. Such configuration allows you to monitor the changes occurring on the surface as you build your biological interface. In other words, your building process can be highly controllable. For example, when you make uh, lipid bilayers, you flow through your building blocks, either lipid vesicles or lipid mixtures. You track the formation of the bilayer in real time by means of extracting changes in the peak wavelength position of the extinction spectra, and then translating it to a time-resolved kinetics curve. This gives you a, a quantitative set of information uh, associated with the biological construction occurring on the surface. 
And this configuration is likewise applied to any kind of biointerfacial processes that you investigate downstream. Another critical aspect of the sensing platform is the material surface. So in other words, the material of the sensor. Nanoplasmonic sensors uh, typically comprise of noble metal nanoparticles that are deposited on a support substrate, which is usually glass or quartz or silicon oxide. But the problem with this is that the active surface is heterogeneous, meaning you have, for example, gold and glass, since it's gold on glass. And you need to subject it to multiple surface modifi modification steps before you could introduce your biointerface. And it becomes a tedious process. One way to overcome this is to coat the entire active surface after the nanostructure is obtained on the surface, either through deposition or direct fabrication with a dielectric coating. So after you have your transducer on the surface, you coat the entire surface with a dielectric material. The outcome is a homogeneous active surface, which greatly facilitates biointerfacing. So once we have that, what are the ways to achieve biological interfacing? What exactly do we mean by biological interface? We see here that you can have two types, two main types of biological membrane model on the sensor surface. One, you have intact lipid vesicles, or two, you have a spotted lipid bilayer. Following the conventional method of vesicle fusion, you introduce vesicles that have been earlier prepared via vesicle extrusion, and depending on the substrate, meaning the, the dielectric coating, if the interaction with the vesicle is favorable, it will fuse and form a spotted lipid bilayer. If not, the vesicles will remain intact upon absorption. And another way to obtain spotted lipid bilayers on a wider variety of substrate materials is uh, through the solvent assisted lipid bilayer formation or SLB formation. In this case, uh, instead of injecting extruded lipid vesicles, what you do is you inject lipid mixtures directly, lipid mixtures that are dissolved in an organic solvent. And as you flow through on over your sensor surface, you gradually switch to aqueous solvent leading to a self-assembly of the lipids to form the lipid bilayer on the surface. So now that we can create the biological interface, the next question will be, how does it interact with the underlying surface? How well can we tune this architecture? We know that lipid bilayers actually float on a thin layer of water. And if we can change the lipid composition, we should be able to control the distance from the underlying surface. Of course, one of the easiest ways to observe this is to introduce lipid bilayers with different charge. So if you have a negative surface, for example, positively charged lipid bilayers will obviously be closer to the surface compared to a neutral lipid bilayer. And if this is so, the nanoplasmonic response should be higher because the lipid bilayer is now closer to the surface and at a region of higher electromagnetic field enhancement. So we tried it and we observed that it is indeed true. We could see a difference in the response when we use a neutral PC uh, lipid uh, versus a positively charged EPC lipid. So we can see that there is actually a difference in the nanoplasmonic response. The meaning is, the nanoplasmonic technique is actually sensitive enough to detect differences in the distance between the lipid bilayer and the underlying surface. And this is actually in the range of one to two nanometers. So it is rather impressive. But what is the, de the dependency of the signal response to the variation in this distance? So to understand this, we conducted with the help of Professor Jiri Homolas group at the Czech Academy of Sciences. Uh, FDTD simulations. So we simulated lipid bilayers with different separation distances from the surface, comprising of either silicon oxide or titanium oxide, and found that the dependency is almost linear. 
So we observe high degree of peak shift when the lipid bilayers are close to the surface, and the peak shifts decrease as you move away from the surface. The correlation is almost linear at this range of uh, separation distance, which is a good thing as it greatly simplifies uh, analysis. So we can use this principle to understand membrane surface interactions. Uh, for example, when we vary the lipid composition of the bilayer to gradually increase the overall charge, the charge dependency of the membrane surface interaction is different on titania than on silica. Firstly, on titania, the lipid bilayer is formed mainly via vesicle fusion, where the vesicles absorb until a certain coverage, critical coverage, is reached, then it will rupture to form the bilayer. On silica, the lipid bilayer is formed via direct rupture, meaning the vesicles spontaneously rupture once they absorb onto the surface, regardless of the coverage. So if you look at the time derivative of the nanoplasmonic peak shift, response, you can clearly make out that in the case of titania, you have a, a two-step process, whereas in the case of uh, silica, it is uh, a single-step process. Then, from the final peak shift, you can calculate the separation distance, and when you put these things together, you can see that the interaction on titania is highly tunable right, compared to silica because of the strongly favorable interaction with silica. In other words, it is easier to obtain tightly bound lipid bilayers on silica surface, even when you slightly increase the charge, but it is easier to adjust the separation distance on titania based on tuning the charge. You can also use the same principle to study nanoparticle membrane interactions. So in this case, after you make the bilayer on the surface, you introduce the model nanoparticle, for example, here, silicon nanoparticle, and then you track the peak shift in real time. So here, inter interestingly, you can see that the negative, uh, negatively charged silicon nanoparticles, when introduced to neutral DOPC bilayer, it yielded a greater peak shift this black line here, then on the positively charged mixture of the DOPC and DOEPC, the red line here. So this is uh, rather counterintuitive. And we later found out that the lower peak shift is actually due to the positively charged lipid bilayer actually dislodging from the underlying substrate as it gets attracted to the approaching silica nanoparticles. We then studied the effect of nanoparticle participation uh, by coating the silica nanoparticles with BSA and observed the interaction with the neutral bilayer versus positively charged bilayer. And uh, based on the peak shifts, we can clearly see that BSA participation is more effective when interacting with a uh, neutral bilayer compared to a positively charged bilayer. And most recently, uh, the group of Professor Jackman at the SKKU demonstrated how this nanoplasmonic ruler concept or measuring bilayer separation distance based on the nanoplasmonic response to decipher membrane morphological changes. What they did was they introduced uh, surfactants and fatty acids in the form of SDS, lauric acid, and glycerol monolaurate to the lipid bilayer and observed strikingly different nanoplasmonic responses. So for example, the negative responses are attributed to membrane tubules that extends away from the surface upon the interaction with the SDS as well as the lauric acid. Uh, to form this uh, uh, um, phallus-shaped protrusions, while a positive response is attributed to the formation of this uh, spherical buds. So in essence, we can clearly see that the ability to measure membrane spatial proximity is not only beneficial for understanding membrane surface interactions, but has broad, broad implications for understanding molecular membrane interactions, which is critical for both 
fundamental and uh, applied biology. Aside from membrane spatial proximity, another critical aspect of membrane interaction that can be studied using neuroplasmonics is the effect of membrane curvature. As we all know, molecular interactions that occur in real biological systems take place at varying curvatures. The natural, membra natural membrane is not always flat, but uh, it has both positive and negative curvatures. In fact, uh, it is known that membrane curvature is one of the most important factors influencing bio biomolecular interactions. Outside of the biological system, it is usually easy to study interactions on positive curvatures since you can model them using lipid vesicles, but it is not so straightforward to model negative curvatures. The way we overcome this uh, limitation is by using nanoplasmonic sensor arrays with different architectures. And then we code them with the lipid membrane. So in the first demonstration, we use plasmonic transducers in the form of nano disks to achieve membranes with mildly positive curvature and nano wells to achieve membranes with both highly positive and highly negative curvatures. While the nano disks produce a single extinction peak, the nano wells exhibit a plasmon active peak as well as a plasmon active dip. The peak originates from the nano well rim, so in other words, the region of highly positive curvature, while the dip originates from the base or the region of negative curvature. So in other words, you can effectively isolate responses coming from the different curvatures by using this system in which the nanostructures essentially act as a plasmonic transducer as well as a membrane uh, template. So we use this platform and employed an uh, amphipathic alpha helical peptide or H peptide to study the effect of curvature on the peptide membrane interaction. We employed this H peptide as we know that it has a vesicalizing property dependent on vesicle size and is in fact a novel uh, antiviral therapeutic agent. However, most of the works that have been done uh, before was conducted on surface immobilized lipid vesicles and there was yet to be a systematic study on the effect of uh, curvature. So what we did was to introduce H peptide with increasing concentration to the membrane coated sensors comprising of uh, the nano disks and nano wells and monitored the plasmonic response from the peaks and deep. The response from the extinction peak of the nano well sensor, which showed a decreasing peak shift with increasing AH peptide concentration, was clearly distinct from the extinction deep of the nano well as well as the extinction peak of nano disk, both of which showed increasing peak shifts with increasing AH peptide uh, concentration. So, based on this, uh, we concluded that. H peptide significantly disrupts membrane at regions of highly positive curvature, and the disruption occurs only at moderately high peptide concentrations. So, in conclusion, it is clear that uh, nanoplasmonics can be used as a quantitative measurement tool to characterize interactions at the biological interface. But at the same time, there is still a lot of room to improve uh, its performance, and this greatly depends on our understanding on how uh, sensor design affects analytical performance, uh, not in the context of endpoint detection, but uh, more in the context of bio-interfacial uh, science. So only when we understand the relationship between sensor design and uh, analytical performance can uh, we fully exploit the technology's potential and then uh, pursue the development of nanoplasmic sensors in the form of devices that are tangible, practical, and uh, beneficial for transnational science, healthcare, and uh, medicine. So here are a list of wonderful, uh, inspirational people that I've worked with. Uh, Professor Nam Yun Cho, in particular, for providing me tremendous opportunity to come on board and be part of this amazing team. A uh, great scientist, a great mentor, a great man, Professor Jack Mendow at the SKKU, absolutely trailblazing, exceptional vision and uh, exceptional scientific wisdom. Professor Homola uh, and Bara for the FDTD simulation. 
and uh, analytical calculations. Professor Anders Darling at Chalmers for the nano architecture fabrication. Professor Paul Weiss and Jay at UCLA working on complement activation studies. It goes well alongside our protein absorption studies. And Professor Jadonov for uh, theoretical calculations. So the works have been done with industry support as well, uh, mainly in Florian, Biolin Scientific, as well as the uh, Park Systems and funded by NTU, uh, National Research Foundation of Singapore, and also uh, Ministry of Education. So uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions or any queries, please feel free to email me at either of these addresses. So once again, thank you, stay safe and have a good evening.